Alcott, 1832 to 1888, is one of America's most beloved and popular authors. Originally published in two volumes, Little Women follows the lives of the four March sisters, Meg, Joe, Beth, and Amy, as they grow up lacking money but not love in Civil War era New England. In this excerpt, the girls prepare to surprise their mother at Christmas and, in the process, learn something about the spirit of giving. A small town in Massachusetts, mid-19th century. The American Girl. Unique and varied as Alcott's four March sisters. Well-mannered Meg, tempestuous Joe, sensitive Beth, and the beautiful but vain Amy. Growing up in a democratized household, a precursor to modern feminism, the March girls became models for ambitious women. What was considered a girl's novel became an important contribution not only to literature, but to advancing an appreciation of the role of women in American culture. Read Louisa May Alcott's Little Women. From Chapter 1, Playing Pilgrims. The clock struck six, and, having swept up the hearth, Beth put a pair of slippers down to warm. Somehow the sight of the old shoes had a good effect upon the girls, for Mother was coming, and everyone brightened to welcome her. Meg stopped lecturing and lighted the lamp. Amy got out of the easy chair without being asked, and Joe forgot how tired she was as she sat up to hold the slippers nearer to the blaze. They are quite worn out. Marmy must have a new pair. I thought I'd get her some with my dollar, said Beth. No, I shall, cried Amy. I'm the oldest, began Meg, but Joe cut in with the decided, I'm the man of the family now Papa is away, and I shall provide the slippers, for he told me to take special care of Mother while he was gone. I'll tell you what we'll do, said Beth. Let's each get her something for Christmas and not get anything for ourselves. That's like you, dear. What will we get, exclaimed Joe. Everyone thought soberly for a minute. Then Meg announced, as if the idea was suggested by the sight of her own pretty hands, I shall give her a nice pair of gloves. Army shoes, best to be had, cried Joe. Some handkerchiefs, all hemmed, said Beth. I'll get a little bottle of cologne. She likes it and it won't cost much, so I'll have some left to buy my pencils, added Amy. How will we give the things, asked Meg. Put them on the table and bring her in and see her open the bundles. Don't you remember how we used to do on our birthdays? Answered Joe. I used to be so frightened when it was my turn to sit in the chair with the crown on and see you all come marching round to give me presents with a kiss. I liked the things and the kisses, but it was dreadful to have you sit looking at me while I opened the bundles, said Beth, who was toasting her face and the bread for tea at the same time. Let Marmy think we are getting things for ourselves and then surprise her. We must go shopping tomorrow afternoon, Meg. There's so much to do about the play for Christmas night, said Joe, marching up and down with her hands behind her back and her nose in the air. From Chapter 2, A Merry Christmas Where is Mother? asked Meg as she and Joe ran down to thank her for their gifts half an hour later. Goodness only knows, some poor creeter came a-begging and your ma went straight off to see what was needed. There never was such a woman for giving away vittles and drink, clothes and firing, replied Hannah, who had lived with the family since Meg was born and was considered by them all more as a friend than a servant. She will be back soon, I think, so fry your cakes and have everything ready, said Meg, looking over the presents which were collected in a basket and kept under the sofa, ready to be produced at the proper time. Why, where is Amy's bottle of cologne, she added as the little flask did not appear. She took it out a minute ago and went off with it to put a ribbon on it or some such notion, replied Joe, dancing about the room to take the first stiffness off the new army slippers. How nice my handkerchiefs look, don't they? Hannah washed and ironed them for me and I marked them all myself, said Beth, looking proudly at the somewhat uneven letters which had cost her such labor. Bless the child. She's gone and put mother on them instead of M. March. How funny cried Joe, taking one up. Isn't that right? I thought it was better to do it so, because Meg's initials are M.M., and I don't want anyone to use these but Marmy, said Beth, looking troubled. It's all right, dear, and a very pretty idea. Quite sensible, too, for no one can ever mistake now. It will please her very much, I know, said Meg, with a frown for Joe and a smile for Beth. There's Mother. 
Hide the basket, quick, cried Joe, as the door slammed and steps sounded in the hall. Amy came in hastily and looked rather abashed when she saw her sisters all waiting for her. Where have you been? And what are you hiding behind you? Asked Meg, surprised to see by her hood and cloak that lazy Amy had been out so early. Don't laugh at me, Joe. I didn't mean anyone should know till the time came. I only meant to change the little bottle for a big one, and I gave all my money to get it, and I'm truly not trying to be selfish anymore. As she spoke, Amy showed the handsome flask which replaced the cheap one and looked so earnest and humble in her little effort to forget herself that Meg hugged her on the spot and Joe pronounced her a trump while Beth ran to the window and picked her finest rose to ornament the stately bottle. You see, I felt ashamed of my present after reading and talking about being good this morning, so I ran round the corner and changed it the minute I was up, and I'm so glad, for mine is the handsomest now. Another bang of the street door sent the basket under the sofa and the girls to the table, eager for breakfast. Merry Christmas, Marmy! Many of them! Thank you for our books! We read some and mean to every day! They all cried in chorus. Merry Christmas, little daughters. I'm glad you began at once and hope you will keep on. But I want to say one word before we sit down. Not far away from here lies a poor woman with a little newborn baby. Six children are huddled into one bed to keep from freezing, for they have no fire. There is nothing to eat over there, and the oldest boy came to tell me they were suffering hunger and cold. My girls, will you give them your breakfast as a Christmas present? They were all unusually hungry, having waited nearly an hour, and for a minute no one spoke. Only a minute, for Joe exclaimed impetuously, I'm so glad you came before we began. May I go and help carry the things to the poor little children? asked Beth eagerly. I shall take the cream and the muffins, added Amy, heroically giving up the article she most liked. Meg was already covering the buckwheats and piling the bread into one big plate. I thought you'd do it, said Mrs. March, smiling as if satisfied. You shall all go and help me, and when we come back we will have bread and milk for breakfast and make it up at dinner time. They were soon ready, and the procession set out. Fortunately, it was early, and they went through back streets, so few people saw them, and no one laughed at the queer party. A poor, bare, miserable room it was, with broken windows, no fire, ragged bedclothes, a sick mother, wailing baby, and a group of pale, hungry children cuddled under one old quilt trying to keep warm. How the big eyes stared and the blue lips smiled as the girls went in. Ach, mein Gott, it is good angels come to us said the poor woman, crying for joy. Funny angels in hoods and mittens, said Joe, and set them to laughing. In a few minutes, it really did seem as if kind spirits had been at work there. Anna, who had carried wood, made a fire, and stopped up the broken panes with old hats and her own cloak. Mrs. March gave the mother tea and gruel, and comforted her with promises of help, while she dressed the little baby as tenderly as if it had been her own. The girls, meantime, spread the table, set the children round the fire, and fed them like so many hungry birds, laughing, talking, and trying to understand the funny broken English. Das ist gut, die Angelkinder, cried the poor things as they ate and warmed their purple hands at the comfortable blaze. The girls had never been called angel children before, and thought it very agreeable, especially Jo, who had been considered a Sancho ever since she was born. That was a very happy breakfast, though they didn't get any of it. And when they went away, leaving comfort behind, I think there were not in all the city four merrier people than the hungry little girls who gave away their breakfasts and contented themselves with bread and milk on Christmas morning. That's loving our neighbors better than ourselves, and I like it, said Meg, as they set out their presents while their mother was upstairs collecting clothes for the poor Hummels. So, how was your guys' test? I heard it was pretty oh hard. God. It was so hard. It was like torture. Guys, it was really bad. Torture? What are you talking about? We're just talking about Mr. Nielsen's test today. It was ridiculous. It was bad. Well, let's get on topic, yeah? Little Women? You yeah, this is one of my yeah. favorite books. My mom read it to me when I was a kid. Yeah, isn't it 
kind of for girls. Oh, come on, no. <laughs> no, no, I mean, that's a fair comment, but how about this? Let's read through the text, and you tell me as a guy, in the end, when we're all done, if you can't relate still. Okay, sounds right. good, sounds good. Does anyone have the prompt or the assignment? Yeah. Uh, think about what the March girls learn about giving. What part does the mother play in the learning process? What part does each girl play? What do they learn about giving it? That it's good, and I mean, what else can you learn? <laughs> Duh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess it seems obvious that giving is good, but I mean, it's something we all learn, right? It's Haven't true. you ever seen a little kid forced to share her toy? Little kids are selfish. They don't really give things away. They're all about taking things. No, I've seen little kids share stuff. Right. But you're right, it's less common. Yeah, and it's a different situation, too. I mean, it's set in the past. Not just any old past. These little women are growing up during the Civil yeah. War, right? Right, and those of you who paid attention during U.S. history, what was going on in America during the Civil War? It was brother against brother. The whole country was torn apart. Can you imagine that? I mean, for me personally, when I think about war, I think about it being in some distant place, right? But this mm -hmm. Civil War happened right in our backyard, meaning nobody was uninvolved or unaffected. But the Marsh girls seem to be doing okay. I mean, besides the fact that their dad is fighting, they seem to be pretty fortunate. Really? Right? They seem pretty hard off to me, I know. Well, they're poor, but they're also fortunate. They right, feel exactly. poor, but Marmy's asking them to see themselves as fortunate. Right, right. But it's kind of a lot to ask. Wasn't yeah. Louisa May Alcott from a really political family? Absolutely. The Alcotts were progressive even by today's standards. I mean, they believed in abolition or ending slavery, women's rights, and saw a need for the haves in the American society to uplift the have-nots. Well, I read that Alcott had reason to identify with both the haves and the have-nots. What'd you read? I, well, like Miles said, her parents were professionals. Mm. They were friends with famous people like Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson, but they did struggle. So uh, poverty made it necessary for Alcott to go to work at an early age as an occasional teacher, seamstress, governess, domestic helper, and writer, while their mother took on social work among the Irish immigrants. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like little women might partly be autobiographical. I mean, Alcott's mom sounds kind of like Marmy. Speaking of Marmy, the prompt specifically asks us to think about what part their mother plays. And I was kind of wondering about that. Good question, Zach. Ideas? Well, Marmy asked the girls to give up their Christmas breakfast to the Hummel family. Yeah, I think it's interesting that she asked them. She could have just walked in and told them they had to, but right, she right. doesn't. It's kind of sneaky. It's not sneaky. She's, <laughs> she's letting the girls play a part in the decision to help. And she also wants them to go and serve the breakfast to the Hummels themselves. Why do you think Marmy wants that? Maybe because she wants them to have the experience of actually giving to someone face-to-face. -face. It's different. Nice, Zach. I mean... You think about it this way. It's one thing to part with something you love, in this case, your breakfast. It's another thing to see that breakfast actually given to a hungry kid. You guys understand the difference there? I do. It reminds me of my community service projects. Right. Didn't you help uh, raise money for homeless kids? Last year I helped with fundraising. This year I'm actually going to the shelters and tutoring the kids. And isn't that a different experience completely? Oh, totally. I mean, in a good way, but fundraising is important. But, but it's different than actually interacting with the people you're helping. Exactly. I mean, I don't know. When I can see the kid I'm helping, it, it makes me feel really good. Well, I think that's actually an important point, Zach, the, the way giving makes you feel. Don't you think Marmy knew about that? Absolutely. I mean, I think that that's why she wants them to go and serve the breakfast themselves. She wants them to, I don't know, maybe, like, feel the pleasures of giving. You know what I mean? Yeah, but I wonder, if you're giving in order to feel good, is it still a selfless thing to do? I think so. It's like Olivia says, giving makes you feel good. If it didn't, people would do it less, but... That still benefits the people you're giving to. <clears throat> so it sounds like you're saying that Marmy wanted her daughters to experience firsthand the physical motion of giving. But the assignment also asks us what part the sisters play. Yeah, well, I mean, it's Beth's idea to buy Marmy a Christmas present, right? Well, giving comes easily to Beth. As soon as she suggests it, Joe says, um, that's like you, dear. Beth has the idea, but her sisters really pick up the ball. Look, it says... Everyone thought soberly for a minute, and then Meg announced, as if the idea was suggested by the sight of her own pretty hands, I shall give her a nice pair of gloves. Well, Meg's kind of vain. She looks at her hands, her pretty hands, and decides her mother needs some gloves. Okay, but her vanity doesn't really get in the way of her giving. What about Amy, though? It says that, um, she says, I'll get a little bottle of cologne. She likes it, and it won't cost much, so I'll have some left to buy my pencils. That's kind of selfish, right? Selfish, so you mean you don't relate? I do. Really? Yeah, I mean, I'm the baby in the family. I get it. Get what? I have two older brothers and a sister. I wore hand-me-downs basically all through elementary school. Wait, are you saying you wore your sister's clothes too? I'll never tell. But look, the point is, when you're the baby in the family, you rarely get something that hasn't passed through a few hands, and 
you're always kind of yearning for something that you can call your own. And Amy does grow. I mean, she ends up buying the big bottle of cologne after all. Yeah, but then she also makes that comment about how her gift is the handsomest now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so it's not completely unselfish. That's actually a good close reading, Sasha. I mean, Amy definitely has a problem learning to be generous, right? But maybe that's okay. Beth, it comes natural to her. Giving, that is. And we can't all be like Beth, right? That's for sure. That girl is like a saint. I mean, is there such a thing as completely unselfish? No. I mean, we were all talking about how community service makes us feel good, right? The assignment is asking us to think about what the March girls learn about giving. In part one, they learned it feels good to give, right? Maybe mm -hmm. part two is that it's actually hard to give. I keep thinking about the title of the book, Little Women. I mean, the March sisters are all clearly girls, right? I mean, why little women? They're young, yeah, but I mean, it seems like this book is going to be about watching them grow up. And remember, it's wartime. There's a lot of pressure on Meg, Joe, Beth, and Amy. Their country's relying on them. So first they have to figure out how to be generous, and then they have to work through their own faults. You know what? It actually sounds like you can relate on a lot of levels here, Zach. I know. It's kind of surprising, but it does make me want to keep reading. Mm, that's good. Well, I wonder if Alcott was maybe trying to make an impression on her readers, too. Well, what do you yeah, mean maybe. exactly by that? Explain it. Well, remember how I said my mom read this to me when I was a kid? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I still remember that image of the sisters walking home back from the Hummels, all cold and hungry. But so happy. Not just happy. It says, there were not in all the city four merrier people than the hungry little girls who gave away their breakfast and contended themselves with bread and milk on Christmas morning. I can see how that would make you feel pretty good. I wanted to be just like them. Okay, well, <laughs> would you be so generous as to switch math teachers with me? Yeah. <laughs> can I just give you my breakfast instead?